Today, we saw the distribution in the sense I explained of Pn of Q in Pn of R. So today, I would like to consider the distribution of Pn of Q but seen in other topological space. So let me first recall that, well, we have the set of places of, of Q, which I may describe as the Archimedean place and then all the finite places. So P is a set of prime numbers. And uh, also for any V in the set of place I denote by this the usual absolute value corresponding to, to V. So in particular A of B A over B P is equal to P at the power the valuation at P of B minus the valuation at P of A. And uh, QV is a completion of Q at V. And of course, uh, we can consider the Pn of Q in Pn of QV and this is a topological space. In fact, more generally, or more, uh, it's more interesting to consider the adelic space associated to Pn. So let me give a partial definition. Namely, if V is a projective variety of a let's say, a number field. Then I may define, in that particular case, the set of adelic points of V as a product over all places of the number field K of the points of V on the completion of K at V. So once again, this is a topological space. Oops, this should be a capital K. Yeah. So this is a topological space for the product topology, and it is compact. As a product of a compact space. OK, so now, what is the distribution? So one may ask, what is the distribution? Well, the asymptotic distribution of points of wounded height of Pn of Q in the adelic points of the projective space. So to answer this question, let me define a measure on the adelic space. So the point is that we have always already seen a measure omega yesterday, which was over P n of R, but today I shall denote it by omega infinity to stress that it is for P n of R. So omega infinity is the measure uh, of yesterday on Pn of R. And then for a prime P, I'm going to define a measure omega P of Pn of QP. And this measure is quite uh, canonical and it's a counting measure on Pn of QP. So let me be slightly more precise. So, 
uh, for any n bigger than 1, we may define a, a reduction map, reduction, which goes from, well, so reduction modulo p power n, which goes from pn of qp into pn of z over p power capital N, z. So maybe I should uh, recall to you what, how we can describe this set if you are not familiar with it. So the projective space of dimension n over z over p power n z may be described as the set of x naught xn in z over p power n z at the power n plus 1 such that there exists I uh, so that uh, Xi does not belong to Pz over P power Nz. And I divide this by the action. There is an obvious action of Z over P N Z star, the set of invertible elements in Z over P N Z. And I take the quotient by this action. And this is a, descri a simple description of the point of the projective space over z over p power n z. So now how do I describe this map? Well, the reduction modulo p power n from qp to uh, z over p power n z is simply defined by the image of a point with homogeneous coordinate x naught xn is given by the point with homogeneous coordinate x naught xn where well, this is a, the image in z over uh, p power n z uh, if x naught xn belongs to z p at the power n plus 1 and the gcd of the x size is equal to 1 Okay, so now, once I have uh, this uh, definition of the reduction map, uh, it turns out that the topology on the projective space, well, is generated by the inverse images of subsets in Pn of z over p power n z. So, the topology in Pn of qp is very simple. It is generated by subsets of the form uh, reduction modulo p for n minus 1 of w for some n bigger than 1 on some subset w in the projective space over z power n z. Well, in fact, it's enough to define the measure on this subset. So, now I define omega p to be simply, so omega p of one of this subset to be the cardinal of w, and I have to divide it by something because I want a probability measure, and I divide it simply by the cardinal of Pn over z p power n z. So you may know that in fact this cardinal p power n z is simply the cardinal of the projective space over the finite field with p element fp times p at the power uh, n times n minus 1. Well, once I have this uh, measure, 
Well, I can define a measure on the on the adelic space on Pn of the adelic space of AQ. Well, I can take the product of all the measures I defined up to now. So we can define omega to be the product over all places. Oops all V in the set of places uh, of Q of omega V. So this means that if I have an open subset of the adelic space, which is given by, so I should translate it. So if U in Pn of AK is given as U is equal to the product for s over s some finite set of places of uv times the product for v not in s of pn of qv, then the measure of u is equal to the product for v in s of omega v of uv. So you see uh, here it's useful uh, to to have uh, probability measures because then we can define this in that way. If we did not have probability measure, we would need that the product of the volume of each pn of QV has to converge. So we will have to do some work to be sure that the product converges. But here, since it's probability measures, it's completely easy. Okay, so now since I have introduced this measure, there is a good reason for that. And the reason is that, in fact, so I think I have the, the room here to state the theorem. The measure which I defined yesterday, which measures the uh, I mean, the distribution of points of height less than B converges to the measure, well, so converges in low to the measure omega, respectively omega P on the adelic space Pn of Q, respectively, Pn of Qv, Qp. So, in some sense, uh, the points are equidistributed on the projective space. Okay, so let me turn now to the geometric analog of this statement. So what would be the geometric analog of this statement? So I think it should be B1 something like that. So So let me start by something well, not too precise, which will be slightly more formal later on, but let me do as if uh, it was easy to, to state the, the analog. So what would be the analog of the adelic space? So the analog of the adelic space would be, well, uh, so, sorry. Let me state it with Pn. Fkt would be the product of our all closed points oops, of P1 
of what? Of Pn. Well, over. Well, this would be the fraction field of the completion of uh, the local ring P1. P. So, this is isomorphic, in fact, to the residue field. the Laurent series over the residue field at P. Okay. And, uh, well, what we would like to, to do is to be able to describe, well, let's take some S in this set uh, to be finite, choose some subsets in, so what it will be the analog of this, uh, where did I write it? Well, the analog of this uh, set, the projective space over Z over P power and this, well, for that it's completely clear. So. W in Pn of the local ring. So I take, I should say, P belongs to S. So it's a point, it's a close point in, uh, on the projective line. So I can take the local ring. There is a maximal ideal in it. And I take it at some power. And I take a subset in that. And I want to describe. Uh, well, uh, the maps from P1 to Pn over little k, such that for any P in S, the reduction <coughs> modulo uh, Mp capital N is in this set I chose is in WP. So I was very un informal up to now. But uh, now you should recognize something which, uh, which we have already seen on the more serious thing. In Carolina's talk, we have uh, seen sets which are directly related, well, I mean schemes which are directly related to this, to this question. More precisely, we have seen the following. Given some, uh, I think it was Z in P1 closed subscheme, and given H going from Z to Pn, okay. Then we have seen that there is a scheme over little k. Let's denote it by more D from P1 to Pn with H as restriction, which parameterize The morphism F from P1 to Pn, so that the restriction of F to Z is equal to H. And you see, to impose that is exactly the same as I'm posing that uh, at each point in Z, the reduction modulo the maximal ideal at some power is equal to something which is fixed. So I will uh, use a small generalization of this uh, of this scheme. So 
So I take y to be a subscheme in the morphism from z to pn over a little k. And I shall consider the morphism of degree d from p1 to pn such that the restriction to z belongs to y. So this parameterize the maps, the morphism, h going from p1 to pn over little k, such that the restriction of uh, where 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 morphism f sorry not h. So the restriction to z belongs to y. So instead of using a single point edge in the morphism from Z to PN, I'm looking at a family of morphism from Z to PN. So now, once I have this explanation of the analogy, I may state the result in that setting, the result may then be, be written as follows. Well, <coughs> uh, okay, if we consider so the class of morphism of degree D from P1 to Pn with restriction in Y. And I look at the class of that, and I divide it by L at the power n plus 1 times D. Then this has, oh, and I multiply it by, let's say, uh, the morphism from Z to Pn. Then this has the same limit in uh, in mk lock as oops sorry as well uh, the morphism of degree d from p1 to Pn divided by L at the power n plus 1 times d times the class of y. So I, how, do I, how do I understand this result? In fact, I understand the, this result as follows. So this more or less means that if I look at the morphism of degree D from P1 to Pn with restriction in Y, divided by the morphism of degree D from P1 to Pn, morally this converges to the class of Y divided by the class of the morphism from Z to Pn. So this means that somehow the points in uh, uh, the morphism of the gradient from well from the morphism from P1 to Pn as D goes to infinity are equidistributed. So of course here, here the limit is when D goes to infinity. So a general conclusion 
for A and B, is at the point are equidistributed in a sense I do, do not want to be very precise now but which is, which is quite clear by the results on the productive space Pn of k for k equal to q or k of t ok so Maybe I should give now a sketch of the proofs of both results, both in the arithmetic setting and the geometric setting. So I think it will be A2. So, um, well, the first thing I should maybe define is the notion of elementary open subset of Pn of AQ. So, uh, for me, an elementary open subset of this uh, adelic. Uh, space, well, will be an open subset U which has the following form. Well, it is a product for P, well, for V in S of uh, some UV times the product for V not in S of Pn of QV. Well, S in the, is a finite place, in the se finite set of place, sorry, finite set. Well, I shall assume that uh, the Archimedean place belongs to S. As I assume that for each V, in, uh, for any P in S, UP is. Uh, the inverse image by the reduction map of some subset WP. So for, well, I should say N depends on P as well. So I should say for NP bigger than 1 and WP contained in the projective space over Z P power NP Z. Okay, and at the Archimedean place, so U infinity has the following form. So, in fact, this is uh, the set I wanted to use yesterday, and I forgot one condition to express it correctly. So, U infinity. is a set of points uh, with homogeneous coordinate x0, xn in Pn of R, such that, well, xi0 is equal to 1 for some i0, and xi is less than lambda ij of xj, something like that. So i0 is between 0 and n, and lambda ij belongs to r. OK, that's it. So that's an elementary open subset. So now, the point is that as Well, as um, this Pn of AQ 
is compact. Well, any continuous function on it Well, I'm cheating a little bit, but the result is still true. Any uh, continuous function on it will be the uh, the limit of a sequence of functions of the form. Uh, uh, well, no, I should write it F n. Which uh, converges uniformly and so that each of these functions is a linear combination of the indicatrix function of an elementary open subset of PN of X. Well, using that, as I stated uh, yesterday, it's in fact enough to look at the number of points in PN of Q which are contained in elementary open subset. So, again, it's a sketch of proof, it's not a complete proof, but using this argument, we are reduced well, to show that well, if I consider the number of p in Pn of q intersected with u, so that the height of p is less than b, divided by the cardinal, the total cardinal of the points of bounded height on Pn of q, well, this goes as b goes to infinity to omega u of over, well, to omega u, in fact, since this is a probability measure. Well, in fact, I shall show something which is slightly more precise than that. In fact, uh, the statement I'm about to prove will be, will give some upper bound for the error term. Okay, so now let me do that. Well, once I am at that point, uh, you see that what I'm counting is some x naught, xn, well, up to a factor one half, in z at the power n plus one, such that, well, the GCD of the xi is equal to one, the maximum of the absolute values of the coordinates is less than b, and finally, the projection of the x naught xn belongs to the open set U, where pi this time I can see it from, well, let's say, uh, q n plus 1 minus 0 to pn of q, which is seen of AQ. Well, then we can do some kind of, so the point is that U is more or less, well, is more or less a cone. And, uh, okay, so it remains to deal with a GCD condition, as in the first proof I gave about the projective space. 
So we use some Möbius inversion formula. which we have to slightly modify because of the UP. And uh, everything blows down. To the following lemma. which is very classical and well known. So let L in R n plus 1 be a lattice. That is a is so, a subgroup generated by a basis of Rn plus 1. And let D here in Rn plus 1 be a bounded domain. Uh, such that, so let me take an extra condition, uh, such that, there exists a finite set I, uh, and for each little I belonging to capital I, there is UI open in Rn and Phi up, phi i a map from u i to r n plus one, which is of class C one, and uh, k i compact in u i, so that the boundary of the domain D is contained in the union for i in i of the image by phi of the compact subset ki. Then, then the cardinal of the intersection of L with B times the domain D is equal to B at the power N plus 1, the volume of D divided by the determinant of L plus something which is bounded by B at the power N. Up to some concern. Well, that's it. This gives exactly what we want. Okay, so now let's turn to B2. Namely, the sketch of proof. For P1 of KT. Once again, I won't be very precise. I only want to, to give you some idea how it works. So now, what is the setting? So I have some Y in the morphism from, well, I should say, start with Z, maybe. So C is a closed subscheme of P1. And uh, y is contained in the morphism from z to pn.
Well, everything, in fact, is accepting is to uh, look at the restriction from a morphism, uh, a restriction of a morphism from P1 to Pn to a morphism to, from Z to Pn. So, we only need to look at the restriction map going from the morphism of degree D from P1 to Pn to the morphism from Z to Pn. Okay, if it was a phi version, then the result is obvious. So is it almost a phi version? Is it almost a phi version? Well, it is. Except it isn't exactly a phi version. And the proof for that is fairly obvious. So, again, a morphism of degree D from P1 to Pn is given by polynomials. So, what I'm looking at, in fact, is... Well, okay, maybe I should say something first. So, first of all, I may assume uh, that K is algebraically closed. Because this, this statement is of a geometric nature, so looking at it over K or over K bar is the same. So, I may assume that K is equal to K bar. And uh, also, I may assume doing a, a change of coordinates if necessary, that Z is in fact contained in the affine line which is contained in P1. So this is com not completely necessary, but it will, makes, it, will make, sorry, it will make things easier. So, uh, but for that I need, at this point, to do that, I need the field to be infinite, which is given by k is equal to k bar. Okay, so I assume that. So now, z is given by some polynomial. z, which belongs to uh, p, sorry, which belongs to the polynomial in one variable over k. So now the map, the restriction map is simply given by the map which goes from k of t, so I look at the polynomials of degree less or equal to d, at the power n plus 1, and I look at the reduction modulo p. So k of t modulo p at the power n plus 1. So what is the fiber of that? Well, if the degree D, which I'm considering here, is bigger than the degree of P, well, uh, this is a line or map which is surjective. Uh, D is bigger than the degree of P. So the fiber of this map is a affine subspace of constant dimension. It's a phi version. Well, except there is a small problem is that in fact here I have to take into account the condition GCD of the polynomials is equal to one. So this means that I have to consider a commutative diagram, which is as follows. So I take Q to be 
a polynomial of degree d minus 1, which is unitary, so unitary polynomial of degree d minus i. So unitary means that the dominant, uh, the first coefficient is equal to 1. And I have the following commutative diagram, k of t, k of t. I at the power n plus 1 goes to by the multiplication by of all coordinates by q of 2k of t. d power n plus 1. And then I have the reduction modulo p at the power n plus 1. And here I have the multiplication by the reduction of the polynomial q. 2k of t. Yeah. P at the power n plus 1. And this is commutative. So, okay, so everything is fine, except that here I have to consider all i's, even small ones. So, I have a problem. When I do the computation, if you look at the proof I gave uh, yesterday for the description of the morphism of degree D from P1 to Pn, I have a, a small problem when I is strictly less than the degree of P. Because then uh, this map here is not really a fibration. But that's okay. Why? Because the, the dimension of the space I get will be less than the degree of p times n plus 1. So the mistake I'm, I mean, the difference with the fibration is of bounded dimension. So we get that the restriction map is a vibration. So up to something of dimension bonded by the degree of P times uh, N plus something like that. But then, when I considered the, the result, I was taking limits, and I was dividing by L at the power D times N plus 1. So in fact, this mistake I'm doing, the difference between the, mo the restriction map on the fibration, when I divide everything by L at the power D times N plus 1, the dimension goes to in mi minus infinity, so it's negligible, and I can completely dismiss it. And this concludes the proof. So it's very important to understand the, the point here. The point is that if I look at small degrees, then this doesn't work. If I look at maps of small degrees, and I impose that, for example, uh, I'm looking at Koenigs going through, uh, I don't know how many points, then obviously the result is wrong. It doesn't work. But if I look at a map of high degree and I impose condition as a finite, as a fixed number of points, then the freedom I get with the degree makes that the thing behaves very well. So the things are equidistributed, but only when the degree goes to infinity. And it's fairly obvious, I mean, for, algebraic, for serious algebraic geometers as there are in this room. For them, what I'm saying is completely obvious. But still, I mean, 
than the spirit of this equidistribution. Okay, so I should arrive here. So another remark I should make at this point before I go further. So the remark I should make is that, uh, in fact, this equidistribution in the sense I did not make precise, implies a strong approximation. Well, the point is that I have a measure, let's say, over a number field. I have a measure. If I take any open subset of the adelic space with a positive uh, measure, then there will be uh, there will be asymptotically some points in it because the constant is strictly positive. So that's it. So, in fact, so this means that Pn of Q is dense in Pn of a Q. Well, you know it already. I mean, it's not new, it's something very old. But nevertheless, this means that if you look at other varieties, if you have uh, equidistribution for these other varieties, and this would imply that the variety satisfies strong approximation, namely that the set of rational points is dense in uh, the set of uh, adelic points. And we can say it exactly the same for uh, the geometric setting or PN of, uh, well, um, let's say it uh, like that. The morphism of degree D from P1 to PN H is not empty for D big enough. Okay. So now the question is, well, how generalize this, this uh, equidistribution? If I take uh, some variety, uh, what chances do I have that this is equidistributed? Yes, is there a, qu a question? Yes. No, for P N it's on, on the ground field. I do not have to change the field. No, no, it's stronger than that. There is a limit which is not trivial. Of course, if I take, well, um, I have to take H to be defined on the confidence like that. And also, I have to take D big enough. Of course, if I do not take D big enough, then it's completely wrong. Um, where was I? Where was I? Okay, yes. So now, it's time to go to other examples in PN. So the so theory is not complete, is not limited to PN. So uh, before I do that, I need to introduce one more tool, which is a uh, height set of functions. So let me start on uh, in the arithmetic setting. So height set of functions. So, 
uh, it's quite general, so let me define it for an arbitrary variety over an arbitrary, or well, almost arbitrary variety, a projective variety over a number field. So, k, okay, a number field. V, a projective variety. over capital K. I take some height h going from the set of points of V defined over the count field to R. And um, what else do I need? Well, okay, I need some W which is contained in V of K. Then I define zeta of W Uh, H of S to be the sum for any P in W of 1 over H of X at the power, uh, oof, sorry, H of P at the power S, wherever this uh, uh, this uh, sum converge. So, uh, if the height comes from uh, an embedding of W into some uh, projective space, to a map uh, phi going from V to some projective space such that Phi restricted to W is injective. Then uh, this uh, zeta function, zeta WH, converges for real part of S big enough. But of course, if I do not impose uh, such a uh, injectivity condition, there is no reason for the high zeta function to converge anywhere. Before I, go, before I go further, I just want to give an example of such a high zeta function. Well, let's compute it for Pn of Q. So for Pn of Q, write the polynomial 2t plus 1 at the power n plus 1 minus 2t minus 1 at the power n plus 1 to be the sum for n going, oh, for rather i going from 0 to n of a n times the n, t power n, sorry. Okay, what can I say about that? Well, then, using, in fact, exactly the same proof as the one I gave to compute the number of elements of bounded height on the projective space, I get that uh, the height zeta function for the projective space with the uh, height which is given by the maximum of the coordinates has a very nice uh, expression, namely, it can be written as the sum for i going from 0 to n of a n times zeta q, where this is the usual uh, Riemann zeta function, Zeta Q of S minus I over Zeta Q of S. Okay, so I should say at once that generally it doesn't have a very nice expression. So you have to choose the height very carefully to have such a nice expression. On it. For some varieties, you, it's impossible even if you choose the uh, the height very carefully to have such a nice expression for the height zeta function. So the proof is completely elementary, so I leave it as an exercise. And I want to go to other varieties as well, so I do not want to speed, spend so, too much time on that. So I should give also, maybe two basic properties about the high data function. Uh, 
The first one is that if nw h of b, which is the cardinal of the set of the p in w such that the height of p is less than b, well, satisfies that nw h of b is equivalent as b goes to infinity to some constant which is strictly positive times b at the power a times the logarithm of b at the power b minus 1 for some a strictly positive and c strictly positive. Then this uh, high theta function Theta of P, oops, W, H converges for real part of S bigger than A. Well, in fact, we can even say more, but uh, I do not need more right now. On, uh, on in the other direction, well, if let's say zeta w h of s converges for real part of s bigger than a, bigger than a, which is a strictly positive real number, and extends to a meromorphic function for real part of S strictly bigger than A minus delta for some delta strictly positive with a single pole single pole of order B at S equal to A. Okay, then N W H of B is equivalent as B goes to infinity uh, to some constant C times B at the power A times the logarithm of b at the power b minus 1, where c can be computed in terms of the high zeta function, namely it is given as a limit as s goes to a of, well, the dominant term, in fact, so the zeta of w h of s times s minus a at the power b, divided by some constant, which is, I think, something like oh, A times uh, A times gamma of P, something like that. Anyway, so this means that, uh, well, this is a Tauberian techniques. The point is that you can reinterpret all the results about the asymptotic behavior of the number of points of bounded height in terms of the, the properties of the height zeta function in the complex plane. So you see in particular here for Pn, well, the first pole of this function comes when the real part of S is equal to n plus 1 and correspond to the term, oh, I should have written i here, correspond to the term i equal to n. So we can compute very easily the dominant term here at this pole and then we can check that it agrees with the formula I, give, I gave uh, earlier for the number of points of the height on the product space.
Uh, also, you should note that when to be able to control really the error term, one has to understand the poles of this high theta function. But of course, if you look at uh, the expression of the high theta function, uh, you realize that to understand completely the poles of the high theta function, you need to understand the zeros of this uh, the usual theta function. So then you realize that maybe it's not so easy to understand all the poles of this high theta function. Uh, by the way, the theta of Q at the denominator comes from the fact that we have to do Möbius inversion. So it comes from the GCD condition. Okay, so now let's do the same in the geometric context. So, motivic height zeta function. Maybe I should say rather modulic height zeta function. I don't know what the adjective is for moduli. It's not very clear. Anyway, so the motivic height zeta function. So uh, again, I will try to have a general context. So I take k little k to be any field. C will be a curve, a smooth projective curve over little k. And capital K will be the function field of this curve. And then I define uh, V to be, I take V to be a projective variety over capital K. So I do not impose for this definition for uh, V to come from the uh, ground field little k. Then I'm interested at, uh, in, in, I'm interested in the rational points, namely the points defi defined over k of V. So this is about the same as looking. So, um, okay. <coughs> I'll write it. So, given a morphism phi from V to some projective space over capital K. Well, I can define a degree which goes from the uh, points of V over capital K into um, Z which is given by, well, simply, I, if I take for x in V of k, uh, well, phi of x belongs to Pn of k, and there is a degree on that, which, is, uh, which goes to Z, and which is given by, uh, let's take a y here, this is given as a degree of y tilde pullback of O of 1 in Pn. Uh, this belongs to the Picard group of C. So as I said uh, or, uh, earlier, well, maybe last Friday, so maybe you were not there. Anyway, so it's possible to define a degree generally for on Pn of K. So, so uh, y tilde is a map from uh, C to Pn defined with generic point equal to one. Okay, I'm going a little bit too fast here, but anyway. So it's possible to define a degree in general for such 
uh, points in V of K. Then, uh, in fact, uh, what I would like to consider is the scheme, well, okay, I need a last thing. I take U to be some open subset of V. Then, there will be a K scheme. Let's say MD of U, depending also on Phi, which parameterize which parameterize the the elements in U of K, which is contained in V of K, such that the degree of so I should give a name the elements P in that the degree of P is equal to T. So, uh, let's say for one moment that everything is defined in fact over little k, so let's imagine that V and U are defined over little k. What I impose as condition on the morphism from P1 to, well, from the curve C to V is that they meet the open subset U. So that I'm now able to define in that general setting the height data function. So the height, well, let's say motivic or motivic height data function for V, for U, in fact, on phi of T. This will be the formal series with coefficient given by this the class of this uh, subscheme, phi of u, t at the power d, for d bigger than zero. And this belongs to the formal series over mk. Okay. So that's it. So again, I should give an example. And in fact, this uh, example was computed by David Burki, who is now in Rennes. And uh, well, he gave, in fact, a much more general result than that. But for the projective space, over any uh, capital K uh, defined as above. The um, motivic height zeta function is given as a sum from I going from 0 to N. So I need uh, some coefficient which I think is i times 1 minus g times zeta of k, which I shall explain. Well, in fact, I explained it yesterday. So zeta function of the motivic zeta function of the curve of t times l over i divided by the motivic zeta function of c of t plus some error term, let's say, Q of T over uh, zeta motivic T, where Q of T is a polynomial so, the, so it has a no pole, particular and uh, well did I forget something? Yes, so I remind you, I call that the zeta, the motivic zeta function of C was defined as a sum for D positive of the dis 
symmetric product of C times D power D, and I should say, take the class here. Yeah. Okay. So, if you compare the two expressions, uh, did I erase it? No, I didn't erase it, so that's quite wonderful. So, if you compare this expression with that one, you see that there are many similar similarities of the two expressions. So I should say that the proof is based upon the Riemann-Roch theorem for C. Okay, so to finish what I want to explain today, so it remains 10 minutes, so I won't be able to go very far into what I wanted to say about the next example, but uh, let me start. So it should be, I think, A4. So the simplest example after Pn is a product of Pn. So let's take simply P1 of Q times P1 of Q. So, of course, uh, I could uh, also take a uh, product of projective space, it's about the same. So, one of the points of this uh, example is that the height is not unique. So, there is a choice. Well, it's far from unique, but in fact, as there, are, as there is a two parameters family of uh, embeddings in P in the projective space, there is also a two parameters family of heights on the product of P1 times P1. So this, in fact, gives the following heights. Well, which is simply given by the height of a couple PQ is equal to H of P at the power N times H of Q at the power N. Where H from P1 of Q to R is, uh, for example, given by the maximum of the coordinate. Once I have that, I want to be able, let's do it elementarily, uh, I want to compute the number of points of wooden height on P1 cross P1. So let's try to do that. So I want to compute the cardinal of the PQ in P1 cos P1 of Q, so that H of P at the power M times H of Q at the power N is less than B. Well, let's start by assuming that M, for example, is bigger than N. Well, so I can write this as the number of, well, the sum, so m is bigger than n, so I should sum over p. So maybe later on I will exchange m on, on, m on n if I was wrong, but uh, the sum of over p in p1 of q of the cardinal of the q in p1 over q. So that the height 
such the height of Q is less than B over the height of P at the power M and everything at the power 1 over n. But this I know to compute. I have uh, done it already. So I know this cardinal. I know that I know that uh, the cardinal of Q in P1 of Q such that the height of Q is less than let's say B prime, well, this is equal to, so some constant which will be 2 over zeta Q of 2 times B prime square plus something which is bounded by B prime times the logarithm of B prime. This I have proven already. Well, let's take the sum. So this is equal. So you see here the, the constant is totally independent of Q of the fiber. So I get, what do I get? I get something. So I get that this is 2 over zeta Q of 2 times the sum for P in P1 of Q. Uh, did I, well, we shall see. So B over B at the power 1 uh, over, no, it's 2 over N. And at the bottom I have H of P and I did something wrong somewhere. Well, let's try. 2 at the power m over n. Um, yes. Okay, plus... Okay, so then I will be... I will have to choose it for zero term. But anyway, so... To, uh, so some constant, so something which is bonded in B logarithm of B, sum of 1 over HP at the power M over N. Well, uh, I should say that, in fact, here I have only to sum here for h of p less than b. Because otherwise, if the height of p is bigger than b, then this set is empty. So, well, I forget about this, and I, in fact, is something which is less than b logarithm of b squared, something like that. And this sum, well, we find something we know, namely the height theta function for P1. So we get that this is equal to 2 over zeta Q of 2 times the height theta function for P1 of uh, 2 times 2 times M over N times B at the power 2 over N. And this converges because M is bigger than uh, N. So twice M over N is bigger than 2, and this converges. So what did we get? We get that, in that case, namely m bigger than n.
Well, the asymptotic behavior is simply the sum of the asymptotic behavior for each fibers for the projection of the first component. So, n p1 times p1 for h m n p. Well, is equivalent to the sum over p in p1 of q of the constant which is obtained for uh, the fiber pi minus 1 of p, well, the first projection, so let's call it pair r, pair r1 minus 1 of p of uh, b at the power 2 over n. But then, if you look at the distribution, take some open subset u in p1 cross p1 of aq. You get a behavior which is completely different because the measure you get so the asymptotic distribution Well, for m on n, well, this will be uh, given as a sum over all fiber of all p in p1 of q of the volume. Uh, so I'm not writing it in the right in the correct uh, way. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Okay. Something like that. So the sum over all p in p1 of q of, of omega p of the intersection of the fiber wire. Let's let of p r1 minus 1 of p intersected with u divided by the total volume of that. So the point is that the measure will be supported by the fibers of the first projection, which is far from being the whole adelic subset. So I will go again into that more clearly tomorrow. But the point is that we do not get equidistribution as in PN. Okay. I will start again on that tomorrow. Is there any question so far? Yes?